ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا من سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله dear brothers and sisters assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh welcome to the continuing conversation Today we have with us, we all know, our respected Imam, Imam Zaid Shakir. Uh, this program is brought to you by Muslim Umma of North America, Department of Justice and Human Dignity. Uh, we are all spending our Labor Day weekend and sacrificing our time instead of spending with our family. I really appreciate your time, inshallah, brothers and sisters. Please, let's start this conversation with the recitation from Holy Quran. We have Brother Hanza Al Hafiz who is going to recite from Holy Quran and inshallah after that we'll have Imam uh, Zai Chakir speaking with us. Let's give our undivided attention to Brother Hanza Al Hafiz. Assalamu <clears throat> alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا لا يسخر قوم من قوم قوم من قوم عسى أن يكونوا خيرا منهم ولا نساء من نساء عسى أن يكن خيرا منهن ولا تلمزوا أنفسكم ولا تنابزوا بالألقاب بئس الإسم الفسوق بعد الإيمان وَمَنْ لَمْ يَتُبْ فَأُولَئِكَ هُمُ الظَّالِمُونَ يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا اجْتَنِبُوا كَثِيرًا مِّنَ الظَّنِّ إِنَّ بَعْدَ الظَّنِّ إِثْمٌ وَلَا تَجَسَّسُوا وَلَا يَغْتَبْ بَعْضُكُمْ بَعْضًا أيحب أحدكم أن يأكل لحم أخيه ميتا فكرهتموه واتقوا الله إن الله تواب رحيم يا أيها الناس إنا خلقناكم من ذكر وأنثى من ذكر وأنثى وجعلناكم شعوبا وقبائل لتعارفوا إن أكرمكم عند الله أتقاكم إن الله عليم خبير صدق الله العظيم So inshallah now I'll be reading the meaning to what I've recited. I recited from Surah Hujurat, ayahs 11 to 13. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, O you who have believed, let not a people ridicule another people. Perhaps they may be better than them. Nor let women ridicule other women. Perhaps they may be better than them. And do not insult one another, and do not call each other by offensive nicknames. Wretched is the name of disobedience after one's faith. And whoever does not repent, then it is those who are wrongdoers. O you who have believed, avoid much, much negative assumption. Indeed, some assumption is sin. And do not spy or backbite each other. Would one of you like to eat the flesh of his brother when dead? You would detest it. And fear Allah. Indeed, Allah is accepting of repentance and merciful. O oh mankind, indeed we have created you from male and female, and made you peoples and tribes that you may know one another. Indeed, the most noble of you in the sight of Allah is the most righteous of you. 
Indeed, Allah is knowing and acquainted. Sadaqullah al-Azim. Wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakallah khairan, Brother Hanzala, for your beautiful recitation. Now I would invite Brother Adil to introduce Imam Zayed Shakir. Inshallah, we'll hear from Imam Zayed Shakir afterwards. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, everyone. Uh, so I'm here to introduce Imam Zayed Shakir. A little synopsis about him. Imam Zayed Shakir is amongst the most respected and influential Muslim scholars in the West. Born in Berkeley, California, the second of seven children, he accepted Islam in 1977 while serving in the United States Air Force. He then obtained a BA with honors in international relations at American University in Washington, DC, and later earned his MA in political science from Rutgers University where he emerged as an active leader in campus activities, helping to revive the Muslim Student Association, co-leading a successful South Africa divestment campaign, and co-founding a local Islamic center, Masjid al-Huda. After a year in Cairo, Egypt, studying Arabic, he settled in New Haven, Connecticut, and continued his tireless activism, co-founding Masjid al-Islam, the Tri-State Muslim Education Initiative, and the Connecticut Muslim Coordinating Committee. As Imam of Masjid al-Islam from 1988 to 1994, he spearheaded a community renewal and grassroots anti-drug effort in the local neighborhood and also taught as an adjunct professor of political science and Arabic at Southern Connecticut State University until his departure for Syria to further his studies in traditional Islamic sciences. Studying Arabic, Islamic law, Quranic studies, and Islamic spirituality for seven years in Syria and briefly in Morocco with some of the top Muslim scholars of our age, he graduated from Syria, his prestigious Abu Nur University in 2001 and returned to Connecticut to continue his work with the Muslim community in America. Teaching frequently as the Imam of Masjid of Islam, writing numerous articles for various magazines, journals, and newspapers, and lecturing regularly at many of the largest Muslim conferences and conventions. He soon emerged as one of the most popular and sought-after Muslim leaders. He has translated three books from Arabic into English, including The Heirs of the Prophets, which was published in 2001. In 2003, he moved to Hayworth, California with his family to serve as a scholar in residence and lecturer at Zaytuna Institute. He is widely regarded as an articulate voice on Islam and African-American issues and a leader in the emergence of an Islamic tradition indigenous to America that seeks to <coughs> reconcile traditional teachings with an experience that is uniquely Western. Without further ado, I would like to invite Brother Zaid Shakir to enlighten us. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله it's a great honor to be here under the auspices of Muna especially for this particularly timely uh, program uh, may Allah bless all of the brothers and sisters involved with uh, making the Muslim Ummah of North America the sterling organization that, is, that it is. May Allah Ta'ala bless uh, all of our brothers and sisters from South Asia, particularly our brothers and sisters from Bangladesh. May Allah give them tawfiq, taysir, qabul. May Allah protect them from the many, many challenges from coronavirus to sea level rise to increasingly deadly typhoons to all of the, or cyclones, I think they call it over there, and all of the other challenges that people are facing, uh, deforestation. May Allah bless them, give them sabr, give them wise leaders, give them uh, the wherewithal to be faithful, uh, sincere, uh, wise, uh, dedicated followers, May Allah bless, bless all of us in this country. 
uh, when we talk about systemic racism and its uh, damaging uh, impact or implications, uh, gruesome, its gruesome effects, I want to start with one that uh, people usually don't start with. Uh, most people tend to include it, but I want to start with it because it is the most gruesome effect of systemic racism. And that's rooted in the reality that Shaitan, Iblis, was the first racist. When Iblis, may Allah curse be upon him, was asked to prostrate himself to Adam, he refused. And he refused based on a claim of superiority. So Allah Ta'ala relates in the Quran, أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ مَا مَعَنَكَ أَلَّا تَسْجُدَ إِذْ أَمَرْتُكَ قَالَ أَنَا خَيْرٌ مِّنْهِ خَلَقْتَنِي مِنْ نَارٍ وَخَلَقْتُهُ مِنْ طَيْنٍ So Allah Ta'ala asks rhetorically, rhetorically because Allah already knows the answer and Allah knows the reality of the situation. So he asks rhetorically, what prevented you from prostrating yourself to Adam when I commanded you to do so? Iblis reply, replied, I, I, am, I am better than him. I'm better than him. And so he made a claim of superiority. So he was not just the first racist. He was the first racist supremacist. And so why do we say racism? So he, he's a supremacist. He says, I'm better than him. Why? Not because of some moral characteristics. I, I'm more honest than Adam. I, I kiss more babies than Adam. Uh, I, I am more studious. I am more devout, devout than Adam. He didn't make any sort of moral argument. He made an argument rooted in physicality. You created me from fire while you created him from clay. And so my fire is better than his clay. So he made a claim of superiority and a khayrun min based on his physical composition. And Every and, and then there's a color element because the fire has particular colors. It might be blue. Many times it's blue. It might be greenish. It, it might be yellow. It might be orange. It might be a combination of those. It might have white in it, as we all know. Whereas the clay that Adam السلام, was created from is black, black clay. And essentially he's saying my blue, orange, red, white, yellow, green fire is better than his black clay. So shaitan is the first racist. Now what is one of the gruesome effects or implications of that? Every racist is following in the footsteps of Satan. Can, can you get any worse than that? Every racist is following in the footsteps of Satan. Every racist, like Satan, is rebelling against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah asked, as we said, what prevented you from following my order? When I commanded you to do so. So what prevented you from following my command? And essentially, shaitan is a rebel in rebellion against the law. And so every racist following in the footsteps of Satan is in rebellion against the law. And so this is probably the most gruesome effect of racism, that every racist is in rebellion against the law, subhanahu wa ta'ala, and is following in the footsteps of Satan. La ilaha illallah. May Allah spare us. May Allah spare us from that fate. And so, as we move through history, 
And you find these racial caste system, systems that develop in various parts of the world. They are all satanic in their nature and their essence because their progenitors are following in the footsteps of Satan. La ilaha illallah. We've been commanded to do the opposite. Allah Ta'ala in La tattabi'u khutuwat shaytan innahu kana lakum aduwan mubina. Don't follow the footsteps of Satan. He is unto you a clear, open enemy. So those who are following the footsteps of Satan, of, of Satan they're in rebellion against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and they become amongst the troops of shaitan. The troops of shaitan. The awliya of shaitan. The qayl and rijal of shaitan. The cavalry and foot soldiers of shaitan. We have to oppose them. How do we oppose them? We oppose them by bringing people the truth. And in our day and time, one of the greatest challenges facing us as Muslims is to speak the language of Quran. Allah Ta'ala, uh, at the end of Surah, surah Qaf, فَذَكِّرْ بِالْقُرْآنِ مَنْ يَخَافَ وَهِيدٍ so remind them with the Quran, those who fear my threat. فَذَكِّرْ بِالْقُرْآنِ فَذَكِّرْ إِنَّمَا أَنْتَ مُذَكِّرْ So remind them, you are but a reminder. And so what do we remind people with? We remind people with the Quran. We remind people with the scripture. We remind people with the sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And at this point, mentioning the sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, I like to segue into a hadith, a well-known and often repeated hadith in this context. And that's the hadith of Abi Dhar and Bilal radiallahu anhumah. And Abi Dhar qala li Bilal, Yabna Sauda, O oh, you son of a black brother. When the Prophet وسلم, was informed of that, what did he say to Abi Thar? You are a man who has the vestiges of pre Islamic ignorance in him. You have not rid yourself of pre-Islamic ignorance. The wording is very important because one of the gruesome effects of American racism, which is very deep and very pernicious, and there, there definitely has been improvement, not to deny that. But as we see in the events, in the nature of political discourse, Racism is still very much alive in our country. And one of its impacts is that it shapes virtually every aspect of our public life. Every aspect of our public and private lives. It shapes the language that we use. And so nowadays you hear uh, a lot of talk about systemic racism, which is valid and legitimate. But as Muslims, are we adding jahiliya to the conversation? Our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said to, didn't say to Abi Dhar, yani, uh, if I can invent a, a phrase in Arabic, innaka imra'un uh, so uh, you are a man who has systemic racism in you, whose life is affected by systemic racism. He didn't say that in, in the face of this racist insult that Abu Dhar hurled towards Bilal. He said, Anta 
إنك إنك إمرون فيك الجاهلية. Verily you are a man who has pre-Islamic ignorance in you. Why is this important? Many uh, who study systemic racism at a very deep level, they posit that there's no cure for it. They, they, they say there's no, no cure. One of the greatest scholars of racism, Professor Derek Bell, professor of law at Harvard University, says that the, the systemic racism is incurable. Many others voice the same opinion. And so we could get caught up in a, a way of thinking that leads us to believe that these racialized categories, there's no cure for them. And of course, not everyone advocates that. I mentioned one very famous advocate of that uh, idea, but not everyone advocates it. But it's easy to get caught up in that cycle. Whereas the language the Prophet used, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Innaka Imru'un Fika al Jahiliya, ignorance has a cure. And the cure for ignorance is knowledge. And so one of the gruesome effects of systemic racism is that when we get caught up in the reality of racism in America, we could come to think that the roots of the, the systemic racism are so deep, they can't be cured. And in adopting that uh, belief, we fail to apply the cure. What is the cure? The cure is Islam. The, the jahiliya of the pre-Islamic Arabs was cured by Islam. Ja'al haqqu wa zahaq al-batil inna al-batil kana zahuqa. Truth comes, falsehood vanishes, falsehood by its nature is doomed to perish. Ja'al haqq wa zahaq al-batil inna al-batil kana zahuqa. Falsehood by its nature is bound to perish. But what does it require? And so jahiliya, by its nature, when it's confronted with the truth, the haq, jahiliya is a manifestation of falsehood, batil. When the truth comes, the falsehood perishes. When the sun comes out, the darkness of the light vanishes. And so it requires us as a community to shine the light of Islam upon it. This is what it requires. And in doing that, we have to do it in a way that involves everyone. If one particular community, if the African American community alone could cure systemic racism, it would have been cured a long time ago. If the Euro-American community by itself could cure systemic racism, it would have been cured a long time ago. If the Latino community by itself could cure systemic racism, and the Latino community is a community dip, deeply victimized by many of the systemic aspects of racism, it would have been cured a long time ago. It's going to take all of us working together on, on the basis of a common platform to cure it. Many of the approaches taken by people, taken by one group, alienate another group. I'm not saying that's right or justifiable, but that's a reality we see on the ground. And when that alienation happens, Many well-meaning people on who, who really want to see change are pushed into the hands of demagogues like because they feel there's no way, there's no bridge for me to meaningfully, meaningfully affect solidarity with my African American or Native or Latin brothers and sisters. Again, not everyone, obviously, but there are a large number of people 
who feel that way. And so as Muslims, we have to have the wisdom to present a solution that unifies us. Because the nature of our religion or the foundation of our religion is Tawheed, the oneness of God. And so we move towards a Tawhidic worldview when we bring people together. The opposite of Tawheed is Takfir, to make many. And so we move away from Tawhidic ideal when we fragment and segment and divide people. This is the nature of reality. So we have to devise strategies that bring people together. In this case, to a the issue of racism. And as I said, the language is important. When we say jahiliya, ignorance, it's amenable to the cure of knowledge. It's amenable to the cure of knowledge. Once we understand that, we understand the importance of Islam. And so one of the, the gruesome effects of systemic racism is that we can so internalize the parameters go uh, governing its very discussion that number one, we feel it's uh, and it's it's it, 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 it's uh, irremovable. You can't get rid of it, and so we can get frustrated and give up. Number two, we might feel the solution lies only at the systemic level. And so I don't, what I'm saying is not to dismiss, dismiss the reality of systems. But if we don't approach it from the foundation that Islam gives us, we might approach it strictly from the systemic level. Meaning we change the institutions, we change the systems, and everything will change. That's part of the solution, not the whole solution. Because if, if we reformed every police department in this, in this country, all of the best practices that are based in, in focus groups of people in the communities that are being policed, and we came with those solutions, and we implemented them across the board, and so we changed the very structure of police departments. We changed the policies governing police policing. We did all of that, but we didn't do anything to address that satanic impulse that exists in the hearts of some human being. You will still have racist cops and you will still have African-American men primarily, but not exclusively African-American Women, African American children like Ayanna Jones and Tamir Rice and others being killed by police because you would still have a satanic racist element working within the context of those reform structures. So, as you reform, even change the system, you have to change the human beings. And this is where Islam comes in. And so what is a gruesome effect of systemic racism is if, it, if we're led to believe in changing the system itself is going to solve the problem. That's a gruesome effect. Why? Because it deludes us as to the deeper aspect of the solution. And the deeper aspect is we need to bring Islam to the people. We need to bring Islam to the people. Why? Because I say so? No, I'm not, I'm not speaking from my whim. I'm saying this because Malcolm X said it in his famous letter from Mecca. What did he say? Maybe if the people, to paraphrase, maybe if people in America could study Islam, it can help them and, 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 and live Islam, it can help them to transcend the race problem because I see all the races here coexisting in harmony, and they don't have that attitude that informs the uh, Euro-American. I see Bosnians here. I see Albanians. I see other European Muslims. 
They don't have that attitude. They don't have uh, the, 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 they don't portray the air of the kind of uh, racism and the denigrating behavior and denigrating even looks that I find in my own country. And so a lot of people will say Malcolm was naive. He was a new Muslim. He didn't know the reality of Muslim society. Yes, there's colorism in some Muslim societies. There's a, a, a lot of things that aren't perfect. But Malcolm, he understood something fundamental about this religion. It provides a foundation for us to live together. You don't uh, you you don't find neighborhoods where people move out of their homes if a dark-skinned family moves in next door in the Muslim world. You might find neighborhoods of poor people and though the, the poor demographics in that country, they might be darker skinned people. But if someone of darker skin moves in, you don't find people selling their house and moving next. You don't find racially segregated cemeteries. They say, what is the most segregated neighborhood in the United States? The cemetery. Why? Because of white folks, Euro-Americans find out that African-Americans are buried there. They will, that cemetery is going to go out of business. You don't find that in the Muslim world. You don't find someone, oh, oh what was the, the race or what was the skin color of that person who was buried in that uh, grave? Oh, they were a dark-skinned person. No, we have to go somewhere else. No, you don't find that. And, and Malcolm observed that. Uh, another person uh, whom we should respect on this uh, subject is uh, Arnold Toynbee arguably the greatest historian of the 20th century. Arguably, some people don't like Toynbee's method, but very few people would deny Toynbee's greatness. And many people, who, many historians, those who understand his, history and understand historiography, historical method, they, they would argue that Toynbee is the greatest historian of the 20th century. He wrote his, his magnum opus, A Study of Civilization. Toy, Arnold Toynbee, in a famous essay, he said that Islam can offer Western civilization two things, a solution to the problem of race and a solution to the problem of alcohol, and by extension, intoxicants. This is very insightful. And this is, again, this isn't coming from some Muslim ideologue. It's coming from arguably the greatest historian of the 20th century is coming from someone with an uh, perhaps unmatched, unrivaled knowledge and command of history and civilizations and the reasons that civilizations rise and fall. And this man said Islam can offer the West a solution to the problem of race. Join me in that essay. Uh, I think the title is, I haven't looked at it in a while is uh, Islam, Civilization, and the West, something along those lines. But he also I, identifies racism as a spiritual disease. He says it's a spiritual disease. And again, this is very important because a spiritual disease is most effectively cured by a spiritual cure. A spiritual disease is most effectively addressed by a spiritual cure. And this is why Toynbee felt Islam could cure racism because Islam offers a spiritual uh, cure. And so again, this is not to say we don't uh, uh, address the issue of systems and institutions, institutionalized racism. We do, but we understand that the deepest level that we have to address this problem is the problem of the soul and the heart and the diseases of the soul and the heart. And so Iblis, Shaitan, was articulating a spiritual disease, Anna. So you can't see Anna. You can see the physical me, but you can't see the internal soul and spirit that animates me, that defines my personality, that is the locus of my receptivity 
to good or evil. فَأَلْهَمَهَا فُجُورَهَا وَتَقْوَاهَا And so that nafs that's amenable to good or evil inspirations, you can't see that. So it's a spiritual reality. But as we develop it and cultivate it and refine it, it rises above its spiritual nature. And then we come together and we form institutions. Institutions are at the root of them, no matter what their scaffolding, their institutional scaffolding or institutional structure, institutions at the heart are collections of human beings. There are collections of human beings. And when we refine ourselves, and when we purify ourselves, and then we come together on that basis, we form different types of institutions, different types of human institutions. And this is the foundation from us, for us rather, to escape the pernicious clutch and hold of racism. La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. Now if we can move uh, from there towards specific institutions that we need to address from that spiritual platform, from the platform of the re renewed and refined individual, we start with the masjid. Even more fundamental, we start with the home. As we become enlightened, as we uh, move beyond our physical and carnal lust, it's the physical and carnal lust and appetites, what Imam Ghazali called uh, an nafsul bahimiya, our shahwaniya, the bestial or lusting soul. That's what attracts us and keeps us uh, attached to the physical. And so skin color, physical features, eye shapes, hair texture, skin colors, these are physical features that only uh, attract us when we ourselves are trapped at the, at the level of carnal lust and appetites. So to, to begin the transformation, we'll go through this and then come back to the home. We have to begin to question ourselves. When we find ourselves affected, uh, attracted, distracted by physical uh, reality. So I, 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 I'm, I don't like people of dark complexion. I don't like people who have light complexions. You know, the, the, the white man is evil. You have a lot of Muslims now caught up in, into this uh, uh, collective den den denigration of, of white folks, Euro-Americans. You know, they're, 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 they're uh, all bad. They're all racist. They all enjoy white privilege, whether they acknowledge it or not. Whether they acknowledge it or not, they all enjoy white privilege. And someone just flashed a, a, a hadith that at the end of time, knowledge will be taken away. That's true. But at the end of time, there will always be a group that is founded on the purity of the revelation. And Muawiyah radiallahu anhu. Qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allahumma salli ala rasulillah. Man yuridi lahu bihi khayran yufakkihu fi deen. One Allah wants good for, he gives him or her a sound understanding of the religion. Innama ana qasim wallahu azza wa jal yu'ati. I dispense the, the seeds of revelation. It's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that causes those seeds to take root. In other words, it's a law that gives guidance. I dispense the revelation. It's a law that gives guidance. Allah. 
And there will always be a party from this ummah. And the dominant opinion is that that party, their members will be scattered throughout the lands. So it's not necessarily one group of pure people in one pure place. But these people in, in groups will be throughout the lands. And they will be establishing their affair on the basis of the commandment of Allah. Qa'imatan. Bi amrillah. La yadurruhum. They will not be harmed. Man khalafahum. By those who oppose them. Hatta yatiya amrullah. Until the command of Allah comes. And that latter command either the smoke that will blow at the end of time that will take people's soul, the emergence of the Dajjal, but the dominant opinion, the Qiyam, Yawm al qiyamah Until Yawm al qiyamah this group will be found. And so, yani, my ummah is like uh, uh, rain. Mathlu ummati, mathlu matar. La yudra. Awwaluhu qayrum aw akhiru. We don't know if the first of it or the latter part of it is best. So you don't know if the first or latter part is best. The end of the time, a day to call a day of sabr. At the end of time, there will be difficult days. They will be called days of patience. Well, qabidu fiha ala dinihi qal qabidi ala jamr. One holding on to their deen, their religion during that time will be like one holding on to a burning ember. Like when you had your cookout last week, like scooping out one of those red hot coals and holding on to it, it would be very difficult. It would be very difficult to do. That's not a tattoo. That's some ink I got on my hand. So don't say Imam Zaid had a tattoo. I could go get one. Astaghfirullah. If you have a tattoo already and you took shahada, not bad. So you were an ignorant young person. Even your family was Muslim. Just don't get another one. Now you know better. But it will be like holding on to a, a burning coal. It will be difficult to hold on. But if you do hold on, وَالْقَابِدُ فِيهَا عَلَى دِينِهِ كَالْقَابِدِ عَلَى الْجَبْرِ وَأَجْرُ الْآمِلِ فِيهَا كَأَجْرِ خَمْسِينَ الرَّجُلًا And the reward of one who does hold on is the reward of 50 men. Minhum aw minna, ya Rasulullah. 50 of them or 50 of us. Minkum, 50 of you companions. So at the end of time, those who hold on to their deen will have the reward of 50 companions. And so there will be, there will be even when knowledge is lifted, there will be people of knowledge. And there will be people basing their affairs on knowledge. La ilaha illallah. And these are the people that will bring down the racist structure. These are the people who will drive the satanic disease of racism from the hearts of the people. As the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his companions did. Radiallahu anhum ajma'in. And, and so the spiritual disease that Toynbee talked about is amenable to a spiritual solution. And so we have to, oh, we were talking about the reparation of the self. So when we question, you know that's wrong. You know that, that you shouldn't have looked down on that person just because of the color of their skin, their physical features. Uh, you know you shouldn't have made that joke uh, about that uh, person, Chinese person, about their eyes. You know you shouldn't have done A, B, C, and D. And so this process of rebuking takes takes place and this is the beginning of the soul's elevation and it's called by our scholars is called an nafs al-lawama la uqasimu bi yawm al-qiyama wa la uqasimu bin nafs al-lawama i swear by the day of resurrection i swear by the rebuking soul so it starts to question and as it questions it begins to grow and if, it, it's, if its growth continues, then it rises above that stage of questioning because it ceases the questionable behavior. And then that soul is amenable to divine inspiration. And that's called a nafsul mulhama. 
the soul that can be inspired by good. And when the soul accepts the good inspiration, because it can still be affected by bad, but it's grown and matured, and now it's more receptive to good. So that soul can be inspired to good. And when it accepts the good and embraces the good and internalizes the good, then it's at total peace. And nafslun mutma'inna. Then it's still and it's calm and it's collected. And nafslun mutma'inna. And that soul is ready to meet Allah. And that is the soul that has transcended racism. And so one of the gruesome effects of systemic racism, as we mentioned throughout, is that it can prevent us from understanding the importance of starting with ourselves. Starting with ourselves and starting with the reformation of ourselves and then starting and spreading that to our families and then spreading that in our masjids and spreading that in our, org our organizations and our communities. Until we're doing that in so many places, we cover this land with right guidance and proper inspiration. And so this, and we have to believe this. We have to believe this. And so we, as Muslims, we don't negate what anyone might be doing. But we accentuate where we have a comparative advantage. And this addressing this disease of racism at a spiritual level is our collective advantage as a community. Adam Smith, our comparative advantage rather. Adam Smith, the great economist, one of the key concepts he talked about in the wealth of nations was what? Comparative advantage. This nation, Ghana, should not have permaculture far farms that look like jungles producing all sorts of stuff. They should mow their jungles down and they should grow, grow cocoa. And so Ghana for the last century or so has been the greatest cocoa producer on earth. And, and per, 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 per capita, the greatest cocoa producer on earth. Why? Because using the logic of Adam Smith, that's their comparative advantage. I don't agree with that. I'm just making a point. So as we look at who's out there, Black Lives Matter out there, uh, other organizations, they're out there. Critical racism, it's out there. I'm not criti crit critiquing any of that. Uh, there are critiques to be made, but there's good also to be identified. But what I'm saying, as the Ummah of Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what is our comparative advantage when we compare ourselves as an ummah, as a community, to Black Lives Matter, as a collective, uh, a group, an organization? As we compare ourselves to the advocates of critical race theory, as we compare ourselves to any, any organization out there, to Antifa, for example, not anyone engaged in any violence or anarchy, but people are genuinely addressing fascism and racism from an, in a nonviolent way. So if we compare ourselves to the new Black Panther Party. We compare ourselves to everyone who's active in the sphere of anti-racist uh, work in this country. What is our comparative advantage? And what does the country lose if we fail to pursue what we're best equipped to do. And this is a fundamental question we as a community have to ask ourselves. Because if we just blindly and uncritically do what all of these other groups or others we could have mentioned are doing, I would argue that everyone is losing something. And what we're losing is the ability to systematically address the issue from a spiritual base and foundation. 
What we're losing is the tawfiq. Because the fact that racism exists in this country, despite advances, with the intensity that it exists, people driving their cars into masses of people, trying to kill them because they hate them, either for their race or for the solidarity they show with people of other races. People shooting individuals because of their race. People uh, denigrating whole categories of individuals because of their race, right? This is what's happening out there. Where is the Muslim voice? And not the Muslim voice uh, parroting what others are saying. Where is the uniquely Muslim voice that's bringing the words, the method, the wisdom of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who initiated the greatest racial advances in history, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Is there a community more diverse than the Muslims? The fact that Islam appeals to African, and Africa is the, the, the first Muslim majority continent, is a testimony to the anti-racist nature of Islam. The fact that Islam appeals to Chinese Muslims, the Han Chinese, by the millions. The fact that Islam appeals to the Uyghurs, who are Turkic Chinese, Eastern Turkestan, not Xinjiang, not the new land. It's a new land for the Communist Party of China. It's East Turkestan for the Uyghur people. The fact that Islam appeals to millions of Uyghurs is a testimony to its anti-racist nature. The fact that Islam appeals to, appeals to Europeans, there are whole nations in Europe to this day. Most, the majority of Muslims in Andalusia and the Iberian Peninsula, when most of Portugal and Spain was Muslim, they were European converts and their descendants. The fact that today the Bosnians, the Albanians, large portion of the Macedonians are all Muslims and other European communities is a testimony to the anti-racist nature of Islam. The fact that Islam appeals to the Turkish people almost universally from the Anatolian Peninsula to the, the, the Irdurne side, the European side of modern day Turkey through the lands of Central Asia, is a testimony to the anti-racist nation nature of Islam. The fact that Islam appeals to the people of the Indian subcontinent and before the partitions where, where Muslims who were formerly Brahmins become, or, or people who were formerly Brahmins become Muslim. People who were formerly Dalat or untouchable become Muslims. And everyone, everything in between is a, is, is a testimony to the anti-racial power of Islam because that caste system in the Indian subcontinent is a racially based caste system with its purest expression as, as the Aryan racial ideal. The same Aryan racial ideal that Hitler built the Nazi program on. The fact that Islam appeals so that whole spectrum in that caste system is a testimony to the anti-racial nature of Islam. But if we don't believe that, and if we don't forcefully advance and advocate that, then the whole struggle is missing a key ingredient. And that's the spiritual ingredient. So may Allah give us tawfiq. And, and, and if we do that, with the all sincerity by mimicking and parroting the, the ways and the approaches of others that thus far has not had tawfiq. Islam has had tawfiq. And the proof is in the pudding. And the pudding is the hajj. The pudding is in hajj. 
We see all of these people unify and no one has a problem with no one else based on their race or ethnicity. That's the proof. Why? Because there was tawfiq. Allah created the conditions for success. And without Allah Ta'ala's tawfiq, Nothing is going to change at root. Nothing is going to change. Because at the end of the day, it is Allah who affects change. In Allah la yughayyiru ma bi qawmin hatta yughayyiru ma bi anfusihim. Allah will not change. Who brings about the change? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings about the change. Allah Ta'ala brings about the change. And where does the change start? It starts within ourselves. May Allah give us tawfiq. May Allah give us tawfiq, taysir, kabul. May Allah accept all of your efforts, no matter what you're doing. May you have tawfiq. And may what everyone is doing to contribute uh, to addressing this problem, may they have tawfiq. So as I said, we're not trying to critique or criticize or, or denigrate or dismiss anything that anyone is doing to address this nagging problem in American society. We're only encouraging our Muslim brothers and sisters to step up to do our part as a unique Muslim, a uniquely qualified Muslim community. Barakallahu fikum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Barakallahu fikum, Imam. It's really inspiring. Uh, there are plenty of issues you have touched upon. I hope all of us benefited from it. But the key thing that I took from your uh, deliberation is that that Racism is a spiritual problem and it needs a spiritual solution. That is amazing, Imam. And mashallah, you have uh, covered that, uh, that uh, issue that if you blindly follow, uh, then everyone is losing. And Muslims have definitely competitive advantage. And because of that, Islam appealed to African continent, Chinese people, Han community accepted Islam. And you went on and on. Barakallah fikum. Uh, now uh, we will encourage question from our audience. Right. While, while they're thinking about the question, let me go get some water. <laughs> inshallah. Yeah, inshallah. Time out. Inshallah. So uh, let's add uh, um, our National Vice President, Dr. Saeedur Rahman Choudhury. Uh, inshallah. Uh, again, we are we are really fortunate. We have Brother Saeedur Rahman Choudhury. He is at at work. Mashallah, you joined us. Inshallah. Professor Rahman Choudhury is going to uh, address uh, the concluding speech for us. Uh, brothers and sisters, if you have questions, please uh, type it up on, on your comment box. Inshallah, Imam will answer that. And uh, brothers and sisters, those who are joining us uh, using phone, please press star five. Inshallah, I will be able to unmute you when you are asking questions. I will know if you are asking question. I'll unmute you, inshallah. So, if you have uh, if you have questions, please uh, let me know. Uh, I will un unmute you. So, uh, brother Adil, uh, I, I think you have some questions. So, when uh, Imam comes back, uh, if you can uh, ask those questions. And again, if there is any other uh, questions from the audience, uh, from Facebook, as I said. From YouTube, Jazakallah Khairan for listening to us. Uh, please uh, bring it your way. So let's uh, wait for Imam to come and for the other, please uh, ask your questions. So I think you have two questions, right, for the other? Yeah, I have one coming from the audience and one of my own. Yes. So I'm not seeing any raised hand uh, from the phone lines. Uh, so, uh, brothers and sisters, uh, those of you who are on the phone line, if you have any questions, 
please uh, press star five. I will be able to unmute you, inshallah. Another very interesting thing uh, Imam uh, added is that we don't think of it oftentimes is that Shaitan was the first racist person. So yes, Jazakallah Khairan, Imam is back. So uh, Brother Adil, please uh, ask, uh, we have two questions. Uh, so inshallah Adil is going to ask them to Imam. Assalamu yeah, uh, alaikum, uh, bro Brother Zaid. Uh, before I, I go ahead and ask the questions, I just wanted to say that one of the statements that really struck a chord with me was when you said talked about the diversity that Islam has promoted. And I must say that, you know, even though I am from Bangladesh, you know, if I look back at my own history, I find that many of my ancestors weren't originally from Bangladesh. And, you know, I just wanted to basically add some more evidence to your claim uh, that indeed Islam has promoted diversity. But with that being said, uh, there were some questions that uh, I need to ask. So one of the questions that I got from the audience was, so they asked, what would be the role of Muslim leaders and elected officials to bring this issue to pol a political level so that there may, would be an effective f real change that might benefit the Muslim community and people of other minorities. We have we have to uh, unify number one, and we have to establish a strong base, uh, a unified base amongst the Muslims who would be called indigenous, not Native Americans per se, but including Native Americans. I know quite a few Native American Muslims uh, to this land because that that is the foundation of political legitimacy. One of the uh, greatest issues in politics is, is the issue of legitimacy. If a leader is seen as illegitimate, if uh, those who are advocating for politi a particular political platform are viewed as illegitimate, then it's very difficult to accomplish anything politically. And so one way that the entire Muslim community legitimizes itself is by adopting the history of primarily but not exclusively the African Muslims and then subsequently African enslaved and then subsequently African American Muslims. Because now as a Muslim, no matter where you come from, you have root in this country. And so you're instantly legitimized. No one can say, oh, you're an immigrant, you still have an accent. You can say, no, my spiritual ancestor. So just as Khadija is our spiritual mother, anha, from the Ummahatul Mu'mineen, even though many of us might not be aware of any Arab uh, lineage, probably unknown, we all have something, but not consciously, we, we, we have no Arab lineage, but Khadija, Um Salama, Aisha, uh, Um Habiba, Juwairiya, these are our mothers. They are spiritual mothers. We might not have any blood connection to Abraham, but he is so far back. By now, we probably all do, but we're not aware of it. But Abraham is our spiritual father. Millata Abikum Ibrahim. And, and so those African slaves, they are our spiritual ancestors. No matter what your, your ethnic uh, or national background might be. And by adapting that history and then helping to empower the descendants of those slaves, we gain the, the legitimacy to begin to articulate a specific set of socio-political demands but what because we 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 have the right to make those demands because our spiritual ancestors participated in large numbers in contributing their blood sweat and tears to build the country on on the other hand uh, on the other hand there has to be a unity 
between the Muslims. And, and this is something Muslim leaders outside of politics will be uh, in a better position to effect. Because generally speaking, our uh, elected officials, they're either going to be overwhelmingly these days, but not always Democrats, and possibly you have a handful of Republicans out there, but overwhelmingly Democrats. And as Democrats, the, the, the solutions, the programs that they advocate are going to be reflective of the Democratic Party. And I'm not saying that's good or bad. I'm not trying to make a value judgment. I have my opinion on it. But the point is, if we cannot deviate from the talking points of the Democratic Party and still uh, retain the support of the party, you can deviate, but you lose the support. And, and, and so we... Uh, as our, our elected officials rather cannot take the lead in this regard. There's a role for them to play, but the lead has to be taken by those outside of the arena of electoral politics. Jazakallah khairan, Imam. Uh, Brother Adil, you have another question, I believe, right? Yes, um, and this question is a completely different theme than the one before it, in a sense. Um, and a I'll, I will preface... <laughs> I'll preface it by saying that um, long before this uh, conversation, I actually read on the uh, mission statement of Black Lives Matter. And I, you know, I read some of the things which were very alarming, like to read it and some of their mission yeah. statements. It was a little bit... Yeah. Um, they want to disrupt the heterosexual patriarchal norm normalcy, the nuclear family, etc. Right, right. So queer black women to do all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's okay, basically, anyway, you know, question? so the basically in, in, more ge in a more general sense, I wanted to um, ask, there are a lot of insurgents and a lot of rabble rousers who kind of hijack, you know, they use the issue of racism as a Trojan horse to kind of put in their ideas and their anarchy and whatnot. And that's what most people see on, unfortunately. The news has a bad habit of portraying these sort of things yeah, to if it, everyone. If it, bleed, if it bleeds, it leads. Yeah, no, definitely. And, you know, my question is, so as Muslims, how do we kind of separate ourselves from all this, you know, nonsense and really focus on the virtuous and divine um, mission of attacking racism? And also... How do we make sure that people like these don't become the main speakers of this issue? You mean Muslims who endorse those various platforms don't become the main speakers? Is no, I mean, what? like, uh, what I was asking is how do we make sure that the these um, rabble-rousers and these insurgents don't hijack the conversation uh, around racism? That's my main question. How do we make sure that doesn't happen? I think we as Muslims have to organize ourselves, once again, to go back to the principle of organizing, the principle of strength in numbers, and with confidence. We have to have confidence that what we can offer is meaningful. And so once we organize ourselves and we build up a critical mass, then we speak our language because we have the mass necessary to do that. And we can then begin a process of negotiation with other groups. So as, as, opposed, as opposed to opinioning ourselves uncritically to others, we can begin to negotiate in the political space and the political space is a space of negotiation based on an agenda that's rooted in our principles and values. And I think one of the things you, you imply uh, at the, be, the preface to your question is how do we remain authentic and how do we, 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 we remain uh, committed to the Quran and the Sunnah and to the worldview that emanates from the Quran and Sunnah and to our moral principles and our family values. How do we remain committed to those while addressing 
a, a nagging societal issue like racism in the United States. So we, we do it, first of all, by coming together so that we have the numbers necessary to advance our ideas and to see who out there wants to ally with us on the basis of our ideas. Now you have a lot of Muslims talking about allyship, but generally allyship means, generally speaking, abandoning some of your core principles to uh, gain the support and then lend your support to others whose values are totally different from ours. So we can redefine what allyship means, but we can only do it from a position of strength. And that position of strength requires us coming together and then carving out an agenda that serves not only the needs of our community, but the needs of many other people out there who might not be Muslim, members of other communities, because there are a lot of people looking uh, for Malcolm X. What do I mean by that? Looking for someone who is politically progressive, who's uh, uh, anti-imperialist, anti-war on the one hand, but is uh, an advocate of traditional family values of the, on the other hand. And, and so there are a whole lot of people who, who are looking for that. And uh, as Muslims, when, if and when we come together, and if and when we build a, 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 a political agenda, a socio-political agenda that reflects the anti-imperialism of a Malcolm X, that reflects the, uh, the anti-racism uh, human rights uh, advocacy and program of a Malcolm X, but also reflects the traditional family values of a Malcolm X. When we can build a program based on that uh, cross-cutting, cross-cutting that will cut across the, this rigid democratic republic uh, divide, a whole lot of people are going to embrace that who aren't Muslim. And so I think that's how we do it. Jazakallah khairan, Imam. It's a, it's oh, a very oh, that's, difficult that's, question. That's an, that's an outline of how we do it. Yeah. It's a lot more involved than that. Yeah, you know, we have imagine. one question from the audience. Uh, so uh, this has to be the last question. Of, uh, yes, inshallah. Do. This is the last question. This, this is hmm. from uh, Professor Ibn Zamir from Delaware. Uh, he's asking with regards to racism and colonialism, uh, is racism different from uh, colonialism? Uh, and uh, his question is, are both of them equally abhorrent in Islam? I think they are different and they're both equally abhorrent. There, there is, I think in many instances, there's an overlap in that the, the great uh, scramble for Africa, for example, that began in earnest with the Berlin uh, Colonial Conference in the early 1880s, uh, it was predicated in large part on the denigration of African people, racial denigration of African people, and therefore they're fit to be subjugated. Uh, the, the genocide of the native people in this land, they, they, they're fit to be extinguished because they are an inferior race. Africans are fit to be enslaved because they're inferior race. So a lot of the colonial project was driven and sort of undergirded by racism. But it's not also, uh, it's not always uh, the case. The, in many instances, just uh, is driven by greed and a desire for resources that the colonizing nation does not, uh, does not possess. But in many instances, definitely is driven by racism, but they are, uh, racism will be the, the denigration, the uh, assigning inferior, less than human status to a people based on their physical characteristics, usually a skin color as the dominant uh, physical characteristic that's driving uh, most racist, whereas colonization is the active usurpation 
of another people's land and then subjugating them to the political authority of an invading and occupying power. And so the colonial project differs from racism uh, in, 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 mo in most instances, but they, in, in many instances, they do overlap and they do co uh, come together to advance. Racism, in many instances, is the ultimate impetus for the colonial project, but not always. Imam, uh, just a correction. Uh, that question, I read it wrong. I'm getting old. I uh, didn't see. It was actually said colorism, not colonism. So colorism and racism probably would be similar though, right, Imam? Uh, they're, they're similar in that uh, people are, are assigned. Well, they're different in that racism involves a... a a claim of superiority based on, on a person's status. Whereas colorism might not necessarily involve a, a, a designation of superior or inferior status, but it does lead to discomfort that might translate into policy or translate into personal choices. So I, I don't want my daughter to marry this guy because his skin is too dark. And so that person uh, might not be actively involved in any program to uh, undermine or deny political advancement to someone whose skin color might be darker, uh, housing opportunities to someone whose skin might be darker, uh, employment opp opportunities, equal pay for equal work, they might be against all of that. But at, a, at, a, at the level of personal decisions, such as who their children are going to matter, color is a factor. So uh, even if we could say colorism in many instances isn't as pernicious as racism, and in all instances does not uh, necessarily translate into a political, a socio-political uh, regime of subjugation. I think that's the main difference between racism and colorism. Wallahu alam. Jazakallah khairan imam. We have a few other questions, but we don't have time uh, for that today, inshallah. Uh, please be with us in future. We will, we will address all your questions. Uh, and right now, I uh, would like to invite uh, Dr. Saeedur Rahman Choudhury, National Vice yeah. President of Muslim Ummah of North America, to conclude the session. Dr. Rahim. Alhamdulillah. As-salatu as-salamu ala rasulillah. As-salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaykum as It was really uh, excellent uh, speech by Imam Zayed Shakir. I personally benefited a lot, particularly he talked about the root cause of the racism at the same time, the, the best way to remove the racism. This is wonderful. Uh, I don't like to add many, just two few points, only few. Number one, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was raised by Umme Ayman. Umme Ayman was a slave of Mother Amina. And Umme Ayman was totally dark, you know, colored uh, individual. And Prophet Sallallahu freed her uh, when Prophet Sallallahu became a young adult. And Umme Ayman married to beloved companion of Prophet Sallallahu uh, Alaihi Zayed bin Harissa. So one day Prophet Sallallahu said that if any of you want to marry a woman from heaven, uh, you can raise your hand. So that was Zayed bin Harissa radiallahu an said, I want to marry a lady from heaven, from, from Jannah. So Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam 
during his time as a messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was surrounded by people of all different colors. This is one thing and many of us we don't know about much about Ummi Ayman. Ummi Ayman radiallahu anha uh, was a companion of Prophet Sallallahu was black colored in a person. Prophet Sallallahu used to call her mother. Mother, mother of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So this is one thing. The other thing is that Islam prefers to remove evil by what is right. Remove evil by what is good. So this is one thing. The other thing is that unity. So when Muslims are united, Muslims can protect themselves better and Muslims can fight better against all injustices. And it is our noble responsibility to fight all kinds of injustices. Racism, not only based on skin color, racism all are in many different forms, economical racism, political racism, and racism based on uh, different nationality. And we can say that there are many people even in our beloved country, Bangladesh, they are victim of political racism. So racism is not just the skin color. And I don't like to prolong my talk. It was highly, highly appreciable talk from Imam Zayed Shakir. And I believe that all of us got tremendous benefit of it. Inshallah, our conversation will continue and we will learn a lot from the uh, experienced scholars and we can do the right thing, what is best for humanity, what is best for the people of the land. May Allah forgive our shortcomings. May Allah shower mercy on all of us, the victims of racism and who are standing against racism. Subhanaka Allahumma bihamdika shadwa la ilaha illa anta astaghfiru kautu ilayhi. Jazakallah khairan, Dr. Saeed Rahman Chaudhary. And yeah. that uh, pretty much concludes our session. Again, I would like to thank Brother Adil. And of course, I would like to thank Imam Zaid for spending this evening with us. Barakallah <laughs> fikum. Inshallah, please join with us for the future conversation. Thank you very much. Subhanaka Allahumma bihamdika. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh